Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Talk Business and I am your host Rick Jenkins. It's good to see you and our first guest today is John U. Pritchard. John is the CEO and the president at FGP. You know them as fine great people probably. Uh, FGP, as I told you at the top of the show, they are an executive search firm, a staffing firm, uh, and they also offer consulting services such as HR and leadership coaching as well. They have offices in, uh, headquartered here in Greenville, but have offices in Columbia and Charleston, even in Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. They got uh, presence over there. You know, FGP started as uh, Phillips International back in 1982. And at that time, uh, F, what is FGP now, uh, dealt largely with apparel, apparel in the textile industry, which as we all know is what uh, at least the upstate of South Carolina was built on for many years. But if you fast forward a decade and you go into 1992 and BMW comes to town, right? And all of a sudden we start transitioning from uh, a textile type of economy in South Carolina to the, one of advanced manufacturing. You, you, you go forward another decade and this guy comes to town and his name is John U. Pritchard, as I said, and he became the CEO in 2002, rebranded Phillips International to FGP in 2003, and since that time, he's done some good work. Revenues at FGP up 3,000% in the last couple dec decades. I didn't say 300%, I said 3,000%. They've even won one of the best places to work in South Carolina 11 times. Folks, John U. Pritchard, welcome, man. Thank you, Rex. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope I said all that right. Did you I did. get it right? You did. Okay, because yeah. a lot of things happened there over the last couple decades. We were talking right before we come, came on the air about you arriving at FGP uh, in, uh, in, in that phase. I moved to Greenville in the early 2000s. We were talking about how much Greenville has changed. Yeah, Greenville, it's, it really is amazing if you think about um, back in 02 when we bought Phillips International. And I think about, you know, um, where Greenville was back then and right. where it is today. So our company has benefited from a lot of the growth in our region. And, but I would tell you, as I think back to our company uh, back in 02 today versus where it is today, the one thing that has stayed consistent is um, great people. And we really believe that it takes great people to build great companies. And that starts with us. What compelled us to buy Phillips International back in 2002 was, um, was really the core of the company, which was, was people. And, and I think back to uh, our journey since then, uh, the people that, some of the people that were with Phillips back in 2002, mm -hmm. uh, they're still with us today and have taken on even more meaningful roles within the organization. You had to have quite the vision in 2002 uh, to, um, to go to work for a company that uh, was entrenched in the textile industry uh, as it was beginning to fade away in South Carolina? You know, um, I wish I could tell you that I had this amazing <laughs> vision. Uh, I think a, a few things were, uh, I think, really important in helping us drive our growth. One was our rebrand. I think that was a big part of it. Now oh, rebrand to FGP. Yeah, rebrand to FGP. That was that was important. Second is we we re-engineered our core business, which was executive search. And then as an organization, we've always been very opportunistic. And we had some some clients who really encouraged us. And I think encouragement is, is a kind word, sort of said, hey, we want you to do this, which this was staffing at the time. And um, so all of a sudden, you know, we, and what we try to do is we just sort of jump in and figure it out. Right. Um, sometimes people say, you know, we'll, we'll jump out of the plane and figure the, how to operate the chute on the way down. Um, and we're, <laughs> we're a little bit more deliberate and methodical than that, but we got into staffing and, and that allowed us to, to, to you know, really offer more than just executive search to our clients and offer you know more of a talent solution. So I think that, uh, that has been a big part of our growth. Um, the amazing people that we have at our company has been, um, a, I would say, the biggest part of our success. For me personally, um, the other thing that I've really been blessed with, I have a great partner with T. Hooper. And T has a lot of success with scaling and growing companies in multiple industries. So he's been a great mentor and visionary guide along the way as FGP has grown. Right. Uh, 
before we get into more about your industry, tell me about you. Where are you from? So I'm originally from Tampa, Florida, okay. and uh, and I'm a huge Buccaneers fan. The Buccaneers did not do well. Last they got night, beat last night. Yeah, they did not do well Monday Night Football. Yeah. And uh, but I came to South Carolina as a trailing spouse. So I was I was in the Navy, and this was back in 1999. Uh, my wife Chris, uh, we moved to Greenville for her career. She's a children's dentist. She still practices today. And at the time, we had. Uh, uh, we had one child, our, our oldest son, Matthew, I think he was uh, maybe like a little bit over a year old. And I had to do my last eight months in the military in the Persian Gulf. Came back to, to Greenville. Chris was part of her practice, Greenville Pediatric Dentistry. And, uh, and I came back to Greenville and I was looking for a job. Re you don't really find recruiting. Recruiting sort of finds you. And, uh, you know, and, and I went to go work for a, a large international staffing company. And I honestly, at the time, really didn't even know what staffing and recruiting was. They just seemed to have, um, they were a publicly traded company. They had the best benefits. So and Robert Half? Yeah, Robert Half. Seemed, you know, and it was, and it offered some stability. And I would tell you, my time at Robert Half was great because um, they, they, you know, they, it's sort of a sink or swim. They sort of throw you in the pool and start and say, hey, learn the business and um, and I learned a lot in the two years that I was there. But until that time, no exposure whatsoever to the industry? No exposure to the industry and really no exposure to to, to really being an entrepreneur and running businesses. Right. Uh, I think the one thing that the military teaches you to do, and, and I learned this when I was 22 years old and I was sent overseas, to, to lead a, a personnel detachment of 35 people. I was the youngest person. And, um, and, and I quickly learned that you get results, um, you know, with and through people, and it's more about them, and you're here to work for them versus they're here to work for you. Right. And I think that's the one thing that um, I learned in the military that I think transcends yes. anything that you do when you're in a leadership management role. So you came to Greenville, did you say in 99? In 99. So only three years from the time you came to Green Greenville and joined Robert Half to the time you decided to invest in your own staffing agency. You learned an entire industry in a few years and, and rolled the dice and went with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would say I learned I learned a lot, um, but I think <laughs> you never I, stop learning. Yeah, right? yeah, and I right, think you right. listen. I think you learn. You learn through um, you know experience. You learn through mistakes, but you. I think you learn a lot based upon the people that you have around you. And I was really fortunate to have a lot of great people around me, from partners to people that were part of Phillips when we bought the company. And and I think as I, you know, when I look back with FGP since two thousand three. Um, you know, you learn to be agile mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, we're very agile as a company and I think I've also had to learn to be agile as a leader mm -hmm. and to really learn, you know, it's very different running a company of 25 people versus today running a company of 100 plus people in four locations and what is my role as our CEO, but I would say probably more importantly, what is not my role? As, as the CEO of our company. Right. Where not to stick your nose sometime. Exactly. Where to let, let, exactly. let those folks do it. Yeah. I pay you to do it, you do it, right? Yeah. yeah, I understand. You're talking about agility, the importance of agility, and I have a feeling that it was extremely important in your industry to be agile uh, in March of 2020 when this thing called COVID hit, and you probably, as we all did, had to do that word that came into our lexicon back then, uh, pivot. Uh, and you probably had to learn a lot of things and pivot in different ways. What what did COVID do to you in in, in 2020? What happened? Yeah, so you know, I think um, I, I think a lot of times when you're in crisis, uh, there's some, something called Cantor's law, which is in the middle of the crisis, everything seems like a failure, mm. and everything really seems like it's on fire. And you know, whether it is whether it's COVID or whether it's recession. We really look at those as, as an opportunity. 
and I, I think it's an opportunity to demonstrate sound leadership. Uh, it's an opportunity to lead your team through crisis. But you know, with COVID, um, you know, once once every, you know once we sort of figured out what was going on with the pandemic, we got people home, and you know, the economy started to open back up. We looked at that as really um, an opportunity for gains. And, and I think that what we did was we leveraged the financial strength of our company and we made a lot of great experience hires and it allowed us time to really work on our business. And it allowed us time to sort of optimize what we were doing. It also allowed us time to sort of lay out more of a long-term growth plan. And it also allowed us to do some training and development with people that um, we hadn't done before. So during COVID, uh, COVID for us actually was a time to get stronger, to you know, pick up some experienced hires, because the one thing that we knew is that uh, when things did turn, we needed to be prepared for accelerated growth, mm -hmm. which is what we experienced you know, coming out of COVID. Right. The, you know, COVID was a roller coaster for a lot of industries. And of course, because it was a roller co coaster for a lot of different industries, it's a roller coaster for a staffing agency because you deal with so many yeah. different industries. Okay, so you're up and down. Um, and now you fast forward a few years, we still have some remnants of COVID uh, out there. And one of the things that comes to mind is, uh, you know, remote work, hybrid work that kind of uh, became popular during that time. And it still exists in a variety of formats. Uh, what does that look like today? Yeah. So I think the one thing that COVID has taught all of us, whether it's workforce, interest rates, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, yeah. is that um, the puck is going to move really fast. And, and when it does, um, you have to, one, recognize that the puck has moved, and, and you gotta, you got to quickly get to where the puck is and in front of it. Uh, I think the other thing, too, that we've seen is if you look back to whether it's recessionary periods, patterns uh, in the past from an industry standpoint are not relevant to where we are today. Um, and, you know, who would have ever thought that you would have low unemployment, high interest rates and an inverted yield curve and we wouldn't be in a recession? So, and, and, and the, ch the thing that people have to um, be mindful of as leaders is um, great leaders typically, you know, make a lot of decisions based upon past experiences. Uh, there's something called pattern recognition. And so we recognize things from the past. We're like, hey, we ha this ha happened to us five years ago. Well, five years ago isn't today. So how is today different? And I think the one thing that COVID has taught everyone is that things are going to be different. And I think people are still trying to figure out what is going to be some of our sort of workplace norms, um, you know, our economic norms moving forward. You know, when this uh, episode airs, it will be the first week of Q4. Uh, so we are fast approaching. And again, we'll be in Q4 when this comes out. So as we are in Q4 of 2023, what Hiring managers, what do they need to know? People looking for a job, what do they need to know? I mean, what uh, uh, if, if you could provide some advice to those folks? Yeah. Uh, so I would say probably the most important thing is readiness. And coming out of COVID, you had the great resignation. You had a lot of people leaving. You had wage escalation in the market. Then you had things pivot very quickly to where people were all of a sudden, it was... People are saying, is this the great retention? And yeah. people, you know, people are staying. But I think it gets back to what I was talking about, is that the puck's going to move. And I, and I think you have to have readiness for whether you're going to have people leave. I think you have to be have readiness for what our hiring plan is going to be around growth. And, and I think you also have to have readiness um, as it relates to, you know, do we have the employment brand that you know, is really going to attract the type of people that we want? And does our employment brand really appropriately, I think, paint the picture of who we are as an employer, the type of culture that we have, and, um, and does it pull people in? You know, there was a time, you mentioned the great resignation, there was a time at, at, at that point, the employees 
had all the leverage uh, in, in that employee-employer relationship, yeah. right? They, they had the leverage, uh, but it has circled back, uh, right? I mean, uh, maybe not completely back because there's still a demand for hybrid, and if I can't do this, I'm not going to do yeah. that kind of deal. But where do we stand with that? Yeah, so I think, I think companies are um, starting to, uh, I think, shape more of a, a long-term path forward where some companies were remote, they're bringing people back in. Some companies are moving more to, um, you know, hybrid. And and you also have companies before that were saying, hey, you know what, because of the great resignation and it being a candidate-driven market, they were somewhat fearful. Uh, we don't want to disrupt our workforce model and lose a lot of people. Today, I think companies are now, with some of the shift in market conditions, or said, hey, you know what, um, we're gonna go back to a hybrid, um, or we, we have some clients that are bringing, we see them bringing people back in, mm -hmm. you know, five days a week. And, and I think they're making more long-term decisions with their workforce model versus decisions based upon sort of the short-term and current conditions. Well, it's not a one-size-fits-all right. type of circumstance. Yeah. Right. Um, why don't you give some advice to companies as they're looking for the best talent that they can get? You know, there, there, there are two things I always think about. One is, is attracting talent and getting the best talent, but just as importantly, probably more importantly, is retaining the best talent that yeah. you have and not letting it go elsewhere. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a few things that um, are important that get overlooked. One is, um, is environment and culture. And I'll give you an example. So, you know, let's say you're a high growth um, entrepreneurial, let's say small to medium sized business that has 25 to maybe 35 employees. It's a, probably a fun culture. Um, it's a fast pace. People wear a lot of different hats. And so if we're interviewing a candidate and they're coming from a larger organization, maybe an organization that has 300 employees, it still doesn't seem like a larger organization. The reality is a 300 person organization has a different environment, different resources, different infrastructure yeah. than a company that has 25, 30 people. And, and I think what happens sometimes as relates to finding and keeping the talent is I sort of correlate it back to, um, you know, you see this a lot in professional sports. You'll have an athlete go from one organization to another they're incredibly successful at one sports team, they go to another organization, same position, and they're not successful, why? Yeah. Environment and coaching. Right. So I think sometimes environment gets overlooked and we don't ask enough questions in the interview about the environment that they're coming from, the resources that they have, the infrastructure, and is that environment, if they've been successful if they say, let's say they've been in that environment for five, seven years, they've been promoted twice, well, that's, that's an indicator of success. And so is our environment similar? Because that's the type of environment that they're going to thrive in. Yeah, you know, using that same analogy as football, it works the other way around, too, in terms of leadership. Because you see all the time in football, a coach, uh, all of a sudden, uh, he's a Super Bowl winning coach, and now all of a sudden he can't win. Right, he's, yeah. he's with a new team. It's not because he, he's not a good coach anymore, but sometimes it's circumstances, right? Sometimes it's just the situation they're in. So, st so sticking with leadership for a second, you all provide leadership coaching. That's we one, do. one of uh, you know the services that you provide. What does that look like for FGP? So, uh, so we actually do a lot of executive coaching, uh, and we do that with individual leaders. Uh, we also do a lot of work with leadership teams and helping them with shared leadership models. We also help them um, around, you know, maybe where there might be specific gaps. It could be communication, collaboration. And then uh, we also do a lot of advisory work. And that advisory work can start at the board level. It can be with leadership teams. Uh, it could also, you know, be um, in, with mood management. The one thing that I always tell folks, the strength of leadership in an organization, a lot of times people think it's at the top, um, and it's not. And I use FGP as an example. The strength of leadership at FGP is not me. The strength of leadership is it's the people 
in the middle of the, of the, the organization that are close to the action. Those are what we refer to as linchpin positions. Mm -hmm. You pull a linchpin out, the wheel falls apart. The mid-level management, the people who are leading the day-to-day -day that are close to the action, that's the strength of leadership um, in an organization. You know, it's, sticking with that for a second, it's important for leaders to be able to report down just as leaders have to report up, right? And I think that's what you're getting at is, is these people in mid-level mid management positions, you report to them in a, in a way, right? Uh, as the CEO, as the boss, you report to those yeah. folks in a way. Absolutely. I think, you know, um, the traditional organizational sort of hierarchy is many times it's a pyramid mm -hmm. with executive leaders on top. And I think today, and I think COVID really taught us is, um, you know, and with the workforce models that we have today. And also, I would say probably most importantly, every company today is a multi-generational company. And as a result of all that, you have to invert the, mod, the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the top of the pyramid needs to be the employees that are closest to the customer and the, the leaders that are in the middle of the organization, uh, really the strength of the organization and driving the organization. And, and they're the, really the ones that have to help shape the decisions of the organizations versus, you know, traditionally you would have executive leadership sit in a conference room um, and they would make decisions. And, and this means that the decisions that they made were wrong, but they might not be as informed because you know the people that are close to the action aren't in that conference room with those executive leaders. Right, and leading by example, right? Pretty important. Uh, I would imagine that FGP over the last two decades is not uh, nearly as, uh, uh, as successful as it had, and at least in terms of revenue growth that we discussed, if someone like you and uh, an executive team doesn't get out there and lead by example. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think leadership by example is the most powerful form of leadership. Uh, I think it starts number one with visibility and, and leadership by example is it's, it's really about your, it's about your actions. Of course, um, it is also about your habits and then it's also about your, your attitudes as well. But I would say probably the most important thing with leadership by example is consistency. And, you know, if you think about what people want from leaders is they want uh, consistency and predictability and sort of how they experience them as leaders. Mm -hmm. And when there is inconsistency and in how they lead by example, when there's inconsistency and in how they experience them as a leader, um, as a leader, you're now giving them reasons not to trust. You're giving them reasons to maybe want to leave. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that I have always wanted from my bosses over the years is good communication skills. Uh, communicating is extremely important. You can say what you think you mean and, and the folks you're saying it to might not necessarily, uh, they go away with a whole different idea of what that conversation was just about. So I, I you know, if I'm, if I'm making a list of the most important things, I want my bosses to be able to communicate well and I feel that I need to as well. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's three critical points um, when it comes to, you know, really um, having, you know, great organizational communication. Uh, and I would say, I think sort of, you know, the first one is, is the lens of the receiver. Many times as a leader, you communicate based upon your lens. And maybe you draft, you, maybe it's written communication or you're talking to a group and you're like, and maybe you look at an email and you think, gosh, this, this seems great. <laughs> well, it's really not about your lens as the leader, it's about the lens of the receiver. Does it connect with them? I think that is, is really important. Two is effective versus efficient. We live in this technology enabled world. And as a result, uh, technology makes us focus more on efficient communication I mean, we can send an email out to 100 plus people in 10, 15 minutes, but that doesn't mean it's effective communication. Sometimes, depending upon the context of the message, uh, it might be better for us to slow down. 
right. and actually do more one-on-one -on -one or yeah. small group communication. So effective versus efficient is something that I think you always have to come back to and really prioritize effectiveness over efficiency. And then I, I would say, I think the third thing around communication is different mediums. And, you know, I think it could be video, company meetings, small group communication, email, text. It's really not one thing, one communication strategy. Your communication strategy has to really encompass all those different mediums. And I think you have to use all of them because people process communication differently. So if you use all of them, then you're gonna create that connectivity across your entire workforce. That's good stuff. We've lost the one-on-one, -on -one, haven't we, in some regards? Yes, we yeah. have, unfortunately. Folks, that is John U. Pritchard. He is the CEO and the president at FGP, or Find Great People. But we're not done yet, so don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right back after a short commercial break with our next guest. See you in a minute.